chocolate, arguably one of the finer things in life. But as we sit back and savor its richly satisfying taste, we rarely ask the truly important questions. We know that tempered chocolate doesn't melt in your hands, but does that also apply to the invisible hand of the free market? And who fought in the great chocolate wars of the late noughties? Who got injured and had their local chocolate-making history wiped out at the stroke of an executive pen? And why is a little store the inevitable result of such upheavals? Well, let me tell you a story. have another first time guest <laughs> already laughing i see <laughs> we're off to a good start <laughs> i'm delighted to introduce you to the bubbliest grumpy cat in the neighborhood <laughs> my dear friend adele <laughs> how's it going hello <laughs> going great if i weren't congested it would be even better but it's going pretty good what's what's a bit of congestion for a bright and bubbly girl like you absolutely it's just a sign of the times and probably the future but yeah <laughs> You know, I thought that before we just like dive into the subject. Ooh, our, diving our, into chocolate. Yes, the chocolicious okay. subject that we have today. Uh, it might be a good um, introduction to sort of skinny dip into a sea of nostalgia by remembering the 90s. Remember the 90s, Adel? Yes, I wish I could forget, to be honest. <laughs> some, Dipping my toes into that one. Okay. Some dance to remember, I dance to forget. <laughs> Uh, you mean you drink to forget? Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the 90s were the years of uh, both of our childhoods. And uh, what we were told, you remember, was a turning point in our nation's recent history. The, the ominously sounding transition. <laughs> and it's not even what, you know, what you're thinking about. So it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that transition is valid. This Absolutely. one was this one was that was yeah, this one was a lie. <laughs> it was all lies. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you know, the way I remember it, technically it was the process of introducing the free market into a country that had been for like fifty something years uh built on a planned economy, right? Obviously. But how do you remember it? Oh I definitely remember the <clears throat> air quotes transition period. Mm. There was a, a lot of dynamic fervor among people and everyone was talking about... You mean oh, riots in the street? We didn't riot back then. <laughs> <laughs> this is the 90s. We, this we was were post just, big riots. We were okay. just hungry. We were just hungry. We were just hungry and kind of, you know, our eyes were like sparkling with the possibility of the new... Mm. Yeah, and that, I feel like that certainly reflected in a lot of places. Did you also remember like uh, the beginnings, the early stages of your like consciousness, of your consciousness of as Adele, enchanted by the consumerist fairy that was like sort of making its entrance into Romanian society? Remember the untranslated, unlocalized ads on TV? I remember, I do remember those. Mm. Uh, it's also really weird the fact that I remember eating and seeing for the first time like things that we never had before mm -hmm. as they were entering the market, you know, because, you know, they were freeing up the markets and everything. The first time I had chips, mm. you know, Honolulu. They were the, <laughs> it was, I don't, I, they, they were probably... Kukuruku. Kukuruku, yeah, the, the waffles. Or all, all the Turkish sweets were like in were, were the shit essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so before the big brands entered the market. Yeah, it was it was a really weird experience, like going into shops and suddenly they were besides being stocked, which is which was an interesting experience. <laughs> uh, they were suddenly very colorful and suddenly they had like categories. <laughs> they didn't used to have categories before. It was very very strange and like. 
we had the little shops pop up, you know, the little shops like a hole Boutiques. in the wall. Yeah, yeah, the hole in the wall shops where you could buy everything that was sweet and, you know, like sweets and cigarettes and booze and <laughs> ice cream and stuff. Yeah, that yeah. was that was that was interesting. I mean, it was interesting in the sense that I had a sense of not having it. And then suddenly I had a sense of having it. Did your uh, parents or your mom uh, ever t- have a, like a line that they would tell you when you wanted something and obviously they couldn't afford it but they wouldn't just tell you we can't afford that oh no my my yeah my mom my, my mom never sugarcoated it. she was like yeah we don't have money <laughs> we can't <laughs> nope <laughs> not today <laughs> we're poor we're poor I, i mean my parents also told me uh when they couldn't afford things but sometimes uh, uh my mom would be just like when she didn't have time for the whole explaining to your child and everything okay. she was like oh that's garbage it's just marketing <laughs> Oh no, no. So yeah, no. I mean she and, and it was actually a pretty, you know, good lesson for me not to be I mean, obviously I was fascinated by what I by what I saw in the ads, obviously, but also I was like, well, sour grapes, you know. Well, it's probably shit. <laughs> but I I would have these very vivid yeah. dreams about things that that I would desire. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Like for me, it was it, for me it was more of a disappointment than anything. And what I mean by that is, uh, when I did get what I wanted, I mean, you know, I saw something, I asked for it, and whoever was with me at that point, you know, bought it for mm-hmm. me. And then I put it in my mouth <laughs> in the expectation. The title of your sex tape. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, that's I'm not, not going to start. <laughs> <laughs> But so yeah, I it it was a disappointment of not tasting as good as I expected it to taste mm. or, you know, not smelling as good as I expected it to smell or, you know, that sort of thing. And I kind of, after two or three experiences like that, I kind of learned by myself that, yeah, mm-hmm. it may look good on the outside, mm-hmm. but it's probably going to suck on the inside, <laughs> which honestly, I feel like is a great analogy for this. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but does our country look good on the outside i mean it does but i mean you know it does <laughs> i mean you know we clean up so you know so other people don't see the shit but you know oh, how it is yeah you know you, you well, you've I been mean, here you've yeah, been well, here well. <laughs> yeah well i i mean um this this is sort of uh, the experience of the transition as a child like right because we were young then yes the disappointment of the shiny <laughs> thing the new shiny thing but, hashtag disappointment <laughs> but i would uh, but i would argue that if there's someone who like drew the short straw it was our parents <laughs> because they sort of had to live through it as yeah. adults and it was uh, you know a pretty shitty time to be an adult because they had to deal with job insecurity for the first time in their lives right because Uh, in the previous regime, basically after you either graduated high school or if you went to university, you were sort of allocated automatically a job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It comes with the goods and the bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry. <laughs> Did that uh, come out right? I yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and also you probably had a uh, shelter. So uh yeah. yeah you were in 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 that regards you had your means secured but uh, now they face job insecurities for the first time and on top of that like whole swaths of the industries so you know yeah. possible job opportunities uh were failing ref- left right and center so it it's like uh, it's really not a good time to be to be growing up or to be an adult so And on top of that, another thing that I remember was causing quite a bit of grief to uh, adults in my life was uh, the inflation, especially in the first uh, few years of the 90s, when it basically wiped, yeah, it wiped out any nest eggs people had, uh, or, you know... Yeah, it 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 was pretty shit. So we 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 got it yeah. good. We got it good. We were too young to uh face the major hurdles. Yeah, I guess, but I guess it kind of depends also uh what industry you were um uh, you were fo- you're focusing on. 
I mean, <laughs> obviously, you know, because but, there there, there yeah. was certain job security for certain types of jobs, but I feel like for jobs like factory workers, oh, and yeah. all that that was not. No, they they were shafted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. And I I remember I remember the the news and it was constantly on the news mm-hmm. and constantly in the in the papers. You know, back then newspapers. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was it was not not good. Mm-hmm. It wasn't cool at all. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what another thing that I remember, uh, because um, I used to I used to be quite the sort of ch- uh, the, the, the sort of child who would just pester adults with questions. Uh, mm-hmm. I would watch the news with my parents. I remember this sort of discourse about okay, things are kind of shit now, but there's a silver lining to all of this, right? Because the sort of lesson that we were supposed to learn from all this turmoil was that the companies and the individuals and the businesses and industries that would sort of have strong fundamentals, right? They would prove their worth uh, on the free market. Mm -hmm. They would come out stronger and uh, they would beat the fever and eventually, you know, we shall soar (laughs) to... uh, more prosperous times and uh you know we waited i guess hoping that yeah that's definitely going to happen eventually (laughs) yeah i feel like privatization was a was a huge thing back then i mean that's when it really really started Mm -hmm. because before you know everything was owned by the state to to a large extent it Mm -hmm. was owned by the state and i feel like when when all of this hit a lot of outside investment but also inside investment went into these but there was also a lot of competition and a lot of competition kicks in yeah (laughs) yeah kicks in your kicks in your teeth though yeah and and during like because of this whole dynamic um a lot of companies were either uh bought out or simply closed the doors because they had really tough competition and they just couldn't you know survive on the market because everyone was suddenly doing everything all at once yeah but i think that uh something that was maybe not very uh depicted in a in an appropriately nuanced manner was the fact that you know on a case-by-case scenario the reason why some of these ventures or companies or whole industries failed uh, was not just because, well, they just couldn't cope. Because I know oh, definitely. <laughs> several examples where, like, there were... It was sort of a deliberate... Some of the actions that were taken, especially at the higher le- level of management, or I don't know, uh, they were very deliberate in sort of making sure that this does not work, that you can sort of dissuade employee shareholders because if you remember uh in the 90s many of our parents who like worked in factories or whatever they were given shares yeah and yeah yeah, and very few of them kept them because what happened as i said with many of these businesses they were deliberately sort of driven into the ground so that at some point, there was a meeting and the shareholders were told to, well, you know, you might as well cash in on these because... It's not going to last long. Yeah. I, I remember that. Like, my, yeah. my parents yeah. had shares and mm-hmm. they didn't work in in those companies or they weren't related to those companies per se, but they did sell the shares in yeah. the 90s. Yeah. But I feel like that, that decision was also heavily political. Of course. But like everything is political. But like to like yes, basically in the nineties we kind of shafted everyone, including this country and its future. Yeah. So (laughs) (laughs) good luck, Zoomers. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Boomers apologize. I heard somewhere. Mm. So uh, now that we've set the mood, so to speak. Oh wow! Destruction <laughs> as a mood. Yay! Doomsday. Let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at the four, first point on our timeline. So um, it was 1994. 
<laughs> I don't know what was playing on the radio. I'm not uh, one of those people who remembers the years by the songs that were hits. Me neither. Probably Michael Jackson. I, <laughs> oh, God. I mean... That's I'm... problematic. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a shot in the dark. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> anyway, it was 1994. <laughs> and uh, then food giant Kraft uh, gained ownership of a chocolate factory in Brasov. The takeover had the makings of a PR fairy tale, at least in terms of, you know, what Romanians thought at the time. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know... Eastern Europeans in general. Yes, yeah. because, you know, people figured, well, there's a big American company and they're, they seem to be pretty serious about continuing a century-long chocolate-making tradition. And, uh, you know, besides that, if you just think in terms of image, uh, Brashov for those who might not be our friends listening to this <laughs> podcast who don't know uh, I know one person <laughs> I know one person literally uh, so Brashov is a very sort of idyllic town in many ways because it has like these densely forested mountain peaks with uh, freaking bears <laughs> roaming the forests and the streets uh, not exactly in Brasov city yeah. but like yes yeah. yeah, the streets I mean, of, of smaller, when they, smaller when they get the munchies villages, yeah. to this day the bears go to town so to speak so uh, apparently chocolate has been produced in Brasov since 1899 mm -hmm. a group of uh, local merchants established the first plant in a former sweet shop and uh, eventually the business became associated and bore the name of a prominent Saxon family the Hesheimers. As you can imagine that was a bit of a mouthful for everyone <laughs> and eventually the chocolates were just known as Hess chocolates. So I'm not going to delve too deep into uh, That's not good. That yeah. is just a yeah. oh But uh, remarkably the factory had managed to remain operational throughout both uh, world wars despite rationing and bombardments. Brasov was also home to a branch of the Stolberg brothers uh, chocolate uh, empire established in Cologne, Germany. The Stolberg brothers had already opened up factories in Vienna, Berlin, Bratislava and London before establishing their presence in Romania and that was in 1922, yeah. Franchise, I see. Yes, 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 we had the uh, we had those as well. Given its foreign um, capital, you know, because of the eventual victors of the Second World War, mm -hmm. that factory was um, seized as an enemy asset <laughs> by the USSR. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, with the advent of the first uh, post-war communist government in Romania, of course, the Hess factory was nationalized. But the Stolwerk plant, because, as I said, the <laughs> it was yeah. uh, in the grubby hands of the USSR would not be added until the Romanian Communist Party sort of went its way, micked out its way <laughs> out of uh, yeah. uh, the Soviet they sphere of influence. Yes, yeah, okay. yes. And uh, they uh, subsequently bought the Stolberg facility in 1954. Production was then merged and the new company uh, made chocolates and various sweets under the very corny brand of Desrobi. Yeah. <laughs> Liberation <laughs> chocolate is what it means. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, it actually sounds worse in Romanian than, you can, than we can actually translate yeah. it. Yeah. Like, uh, but, but, but then if you think uh, about it, it makes sense because, again, for the one listener who is not from Romania, <laughs> Brasov, the city itself, was for like two decades almost, I was renamed yeah. Stalin. <laughs> Just straight up, the city Stalin. <laughs> but thankfully, eventually, the brand name was ch uh, was changed to Chibo, and that was that in terms of branding until the nineties. To my knowledge, Chibo. I mean, it it is obviously a coffee company, but I. Well, no, 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 not that Chibo, because it didn't have the T S C. Oh, it's oh. like Chibo, Romanian Chibo. In the 90s, after mm -hmm. the takeover, they uh, did the rebranding and uh, basically the name by which our generation knew the chocolates that were produced in Brasov was Poyana. Poyana la mine, Poyana la tine, Poyana la toți, cu nici nepoți, un gust delicios. By the way, uh, Adel, do you have like a sort of memory associated with the 
Poyana chocolate because, uh, you know, at the time, considering the offer, this is sort of before the, the, the emergence of Milka or other such chocolates on the Romanian market, or at least for the poor, <laughs> before it was affordable, Poyana was kind of like the shit because all the other chocolates were subpar in comparison, I would say. That's definitely true. Uh, I remember eating it, wow, I don't know, I must have been like five. Hmm. Um, and of course I liked it, but again, like the... You the, had bourgeois taste even then. You, of course I You did. thought about the fact that mm, we, I, we <laughs> can do better than this. Come on, Romania, we can do so much better than yeah, this. Yeah, like the, the issue for me was though that uh, very early in my childhood, because of my family's connections with the outside and, you know, Germany and Austria... <gasps> Bragging now. Bragging. I'm yes, definitely. I'm just mm. <laughs> <laughs> bragging right now. Uh, I used to get a lot of care packages from extended family. So jealous now. Yeah. Ret retroactively I, jealous. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd be too. So <laughs> forgiven, <laughs> definitely. But I did try Milka before it ever got into our markets. I tried Milka before it was cool. Yeah, but listen, it was great. It was like. <laughs> You know, like right. eating the fingers of angels, but <laughs> <laughs> the biggest drawback to that was that it really ruined me for all other chocolates on the market. So all I did afterwards was just eat kukuruku and cry. <laughs> because, yeah, it was just like... Did, it, did, 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 did you get... Uh... Did your parents buy you kukuruku? Because my parents were like, no, that shit's too expensive for like a wafer. Well, I did. But that's because it was the only thing I wanted to eat. <laughs> that was sweet. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't really... Did you blackmail your sweet. way into getting it? I mean, <laughs> yes, but the, it was only because they came with those stupid stickers and the stu <laughs> stupid sticker album that I had to just, I don't know why, what was wrong. You gotta catch them all. Did, but I did want to catch them all. And then I gave up halfway because I got pissed because I kept getting like doubles and triples and like, that was yeah. it. and there was no one to like exchange Swipe. with. Yeah. yeah. And it was just Swipe. so, yeah, I was just, I gave up. Yeah, well, we're not just going off of anecdotes here because uh, it seems like uh, the numbers back at corporate, at Kraft, also uh, show that, yeah, the, the business, business was booming, so to speak. In fact, in 2008, Kraft's operation in Romania, which included uh, chocolate, coffee and assorted sweets, as you mm -hmm. mentioned as well, with Poyana as the number one brand for uh, chocolate bars, had seen double-digit growth. Uh, the highest since the company's uh, takeover. In short, the story of the Brasov chocolate factory was one of those uh, rare examples of privatization done right, trust us. Most privatizations in Romania had a very sad ending, so this was one of the good ones. I mean, I remember, I remember for like a period of almost 10 years seeing Poyana everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was certainly after it was bought by, by Kraft, but... I just remember thinking that it was so strange that we had like this thing that is produced in Romania that is so successful and it, it was it was for like a, a relatively long period of time and I remember uh, you know like after I grew up a bit and started researching on my own and everything uh, I realized that after Kraft bought the factory, they invested a lot of money into, you know, modernizing and everything. So I guess that really did pay off. And in that sense, yes, it is a success story in terms of privatization. Let's uh, make a jump cut here and uh, switch continents. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're going to also uh, uh, make a leap in time. Ooh. Yes, so many <laughs> leaps. <laughs> we're doing ca cardio today. Uh, between the, we're between 2005 and 2008, uh, when plans were um, set in motion to change the way business was done in craft uh, foods. An initiative titled Organizing for Growth began to circulate. Its aim was to dismantle the existing organizational matrix and replace it with a decentralized structure with more direct lines of responsibility. Which just means that we're <laughs> Jesus take the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, uh, just to sort of uh, put this movie into context, I, I guess one of the main reasons why they needed to do this whole rehashing was because, after all, craft had come about following heaps and heaps of mergers. So, uh, you know, you had Philip Morris bought General Foods in 1985, then bought Kraft in 1988, Oscar Mayer, Nabisco, and J Jakob Suchard in Europe. Like, these were all sort of mergers, and uh, I'm sure all were above the board and scandal-free. I mean, I, I think uh, by the time uh, Philip Morris bought Jakob Suchard, I think that was still to date the largest acquisition uh, made by a foreign investor in, in Switzerland. To, you know, of a Swiss company. Mm. And they they were on this acquisition spree all over Europe and Eastern Europe especially. I'm, I'm not sure if they went into Russia, but they definitely hit our neighbors. <laughs> 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 definitely Ukraine was... Ukraine in the membrane. <laughs> that is, yes. <laughs> I must agree. <laughs> but yeah, I'm guessing like after so many mergers, it, it was difficult to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, to... sure, sure, sure. It gets messy and nobody wants to not sure, be the I... boss anymore. Absolutely, and, yeah. but it's not like this this is just this was this is just double speak for um <laughs> I think okay, we're a bit overextended here. Yeah. We don't really know what to do. Yeah. Halt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean in general, mergers I know we we both know mergers are just so great for like competitive environment, Absolutely. right? Yeah. They're they oh, Corporate was also aiming to fix another problem because, um, as you said, you know, they for 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 a few years after the I guess the Iron Curtain went swoosh, they kept uh, buying, as you said, buying and merging and taking over stuff in like these here parts because um, it was relatively cheap. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They really did buy things for cheap, including Poyama. Yeah. But you know, by <laughs> the time we are in the mid noughties, mm -hmm. uh, these markets, uh, you know, they are quickly maturing and labor costs, although still lower, obviously, and to yeah. this day they are lower, you know, they were rising. And if there's one thing <laughs> corporate uh, uh, executives do not like is when, you know, it's still cheap, but it's not as cheap as it used to be. <laughs> and besides that, uh, rivals who had access to large emerging markets, China or India, uh, just, uh, you know, had the much juicier bits. And uh, Kraft sort of wanted a piece of that. Uh, by 2007, uh, Kraft uh, had set its sights on Cadbury. The UK-based uh, confectionery was the second largest at the time, and its performances during the uh, recession that was soon to come were due to its presence in, like I said, the sizable markets of India. And in comes Irene Rosenfeld, who assumed the role of CEO at Kraft in 2007. She then proceeded to girl boss. <laughs> really hard, developing a three-year turnaround plan designed to drive growth the way only a girl boss can, right? So, slave uh, labor? I... Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Downsizing well, and slave labor, I'm guessing. I, I mean... <laughs> She had her own special mix, I guess. But uh, I mean, we 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 branded and we marketed as something else. But that's what it is. Yes, still? okay. Yeah, I mean, obviously, <laughs> yeah. And the 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 important thing to remember is that the Cadbury purchase was uh, part of that strategy. But there was a snag. Cadbury was not for sale. Oh, <laughs> but did she steal it? <laughs> 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 it sounds like that's what she did. Okay. Well, you know, in the corporate world, no means yes, sure thing, provided you can gin up the necessary money. <laughs> so if corporations are people, I guess uh, it's really high time for a Me Too mo movement uh, in yeah. there. Right, definitely. Yeah. So what happened was Kraft launched a hostile takeover bid. It's legal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, it, if I it's, mean, I understand, but yes. just what? Yes. What? Well, it, it, yeah, it sparked quite a bit of uh, controversy, as you can imagine. Uh, given the sheer size of the two businesses, um, and you know what the absorption of one into another would mean for basic competition on a market, the European Commission stepped in. <laughs> 
the European Commission and uh, uh, what it found was that craft dominated most markets in the EEA, while the British and the Irish public's preference for homegrown brands such as Cadbury uh, assured its leading position in mm -hmm. those markets. However, the Commission identified competition concerns within chocolate confectionery in some European countries in which like, they would both have a majority presence should mm -hmm. they merge. Those two markets were uh, Poland and uh, Romania. Dum dum dum. <laughs> yeah, this is this is because yeah, this is population size and mostly population size. Oh, <laughs> like because yeah. So uh, back in Romania, after uh, you know the previous year in which uh, they were bragging about their numbers, they've uh, announced the, the, their intention to cease operations in Brasov, outsourcing them to one of their factories in Bulgaria. Uh, as the news broke, uh, a familiar story was rolled out. This, ho this time, however, with a bit of a twist, because uh, I think we both grew up with this um, uncritically accepting this idea of the inevitable downfall and uh, dereliction of Romanian manufacturing, right? We, we, we believed that the old had to die to make room for the new, and there was no way to extract or keep or update anything of the old, right? Because you just it had to crash and burn and then hopefully make room for whatever else would come later. I think it was sort of a good way to dissuade people from looking too closely at things. And maybe if you thought that everything was supposed to go to shit, maybe you weren't going to fault the person who sold the assets and pocketed the money. It happened many times. I feel like to an extent that is true. I mean, especially if you think, if you consider the fact that there is an entire generation of people who had no comparison term mm -hmm. in terms of how things could be done or how things should be done, or they were still very innocent <laughs> in this sense. Yeah, and also it's important to remember that our parents' generation was exactly the generation that had zero memory of what the world looked like before, before, them. before the, the communist regime, yeah. because their grandparents or great-grandparents, our great-grandparents, they also sort of lived through the monarchy and the sort of free market thing, whatever that was. It was basically Victorian England in the early 20th century in Romania. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, but our parents did not, so they were just like... <sighs> yeah, so, so it's difficult to fault them, like, if, if I mean, I understand rationally that it's difficult to fault them, but at the same time, like, well... <laughs> You're I mean, like, Mom! Like, it's still your fault, like, it's your generation that put us here, I'm sorry, because <laughs> it's true. Um... Uh... But um, in a way, there was uh, a slight in inconvenience in applying that template to the Puyana affair because the factory had been updated and extended successfully. Kraft had trained labor force because, as we said, chocolate production had been ongoing mm -hmm. and um, it had reported great numbers just a year earlier. So it wasn't the case that the business was not going well. And uh, once uh, news of the future relocation came out, the local representatives actually invited the company over to discuss solutions to keep the business in Brussels. Shop. So even the whole wow, just local politicians didn't do enough. It it doesn't really apply to this case. Now whether or not that was a half-assed attempt or not, that's another discussion. But like they tried. <laughs> I mean, if you have no leverage, there's no point in trying. <laughs> yeah, sure. especially with huge companies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, Kraft tries to sort of come up with different explanations for his decision. Doina Kavake, who was corporate affairs manager at the time, argued that the factory's central location within the city uh, sort of severely limited uh, uh, their ability for expansion. The local council offered up land for mm -hmm. like uh, greenfield development, but they were like, 
nah. And uh, also buying up another greater warehouse was also off the table. So they, they weren't there to negotiate any solutions. They were like, nah, we're leaving. They did eventually uh, mentioned the lower cost of uh, real estate and labor in Bulgaria to explain away their decision, but come on, at, the, at that level, the difference is not that great. As I was uh, doing research for this episode, I also stumbled upon a slideshow from what was, I assume, the last Christmas party for the employees of the chocolate factory in 2008. And uh, I will show it to you. It's, wow, uh, 2008, that's... Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> speak, naughties, PowerPoint, barely their eyebrows, shiny shirts, wow. silver eyeshadow nostalgia so i got the feels a bit because as i was looking at it you just see all the sort of smiling faces and the workforce was made up of different uh, sort of generations of people because you also had younger folks working mm -hmm. there and uh just wondering you know how it must have felt because just a few weeks before the announce was, announcement was made that they were going to just close shop and uh it must have been strange because, you know, just a year prior, you were like, yes, we are great. We are doing great. We are, even though the recession was sort of looming, they were told, and for once, this was not a lie, that the recession did not really uh, factor in the decision to, to relocate. So, yeah, either way, but those were like hundreds of people that, you know, were suddenly jobless, you know, you know, with very, very few prospects considering the the economic situation globally, but especially in Romania. Mm -hmm. Uh, and especially when you have more, uh, or or when you have a factory where you also have employees over the age of I don't know thirty five or forty. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, that's rough. They did get a severance package, and uh, yeah, but even so, yeah. if you think about it, recession hit us mm -hmm. heavily somewhere around two thousand nine, two thousand ten. So those yeah. were two years. You know, I don't, I don't know of any severance packages that could possibly last that long, even if you're frugal. Like. Yeah, yeah, and also, I mean, they did brag. I mean, uh, Kraft, they did brag about the fact that uh, they took care of their employees because they did help them sort of get new jobs. And uh, as we shall see, uh, there was like a little arrangement made with one of their former contractors for moving a portion of the production to Gimbav. I wanted to ask, didn't they though? Like I thought... Yeah, but okay. it was downsized heavily. So, uh, kind of like uh, the reason why uh, I wanted us to have a closer look at the Poyana story is because I think that it's one of those uh, where looking at it through like the larger context of corporate strategies is uh, much more uh, illuminating in terms of what happened and why. We talked about cost cutting and outsourcing and things like that. That's obviously something that's uh, happening and it's important to people who, who are up there on the corporate ladder and who want to, to make a name for themselves. Yeah, uh, as what? Assholes? <laughs> Yeah, but I think that in the case of uh, Brash the Brashov chocolate factory, regardless of the wage freezes or even wage cuts that mm -hmm. the employees would have accepted or the different offers that the local authorities would have uh, come up with. The, the, the factory was basically a bargaining chip in a much larger story. Things were set in motion and would have happened anyhow. So the fact of the matter was that the big prize was Cadbury. And uh, I actually dug through SEC filing okay. of Kraft from 2010, where they laid out the terms of the European Commission for allowing their takeover. Mm -hmm. It reads, the EU Commission required that we divest certain Cadbury confectionery operations in Poland and Romania. 
In 2010, we completed the sale of the assets of the confectionery operations in Poland and Romania. Uh, the document does not state specifically that uh, the EU Commission told them, you know, sell the Poyana Brasov, uh, the Poyana uh, factory, and then you are allowed to do this. No, but like they were shuffling around certain assets because once they would have acquired uh, Cadbury, Cadbury had taken over Candia and Excellent already on the Romanian chocolate maker. Yeah. Uh, market so they had to sort of okay so that we don't uh, get slapped with an anti-monopoly uh, uh, yeah I think monopolization was obviously yeah. the issue in both Romania and Poland but not just there mm-hmm. but those were the big ones but what I don't understand is why they didn't just sell it instead of just closing operations and then just like poof what sell it to a competitor obviously <gasps> because no matter no matter who no matter who they would have so they would have sold it to i feel like um it, it would not have been an actual competitor i mean in officially yes they would have been a competitor but not really considering the market share that they had in europe anyhow Adel, what are you suggesting that they might you know give a damn about the local community and destroying a local tradition <laughs> is that what no you're i'm just say? thinking that in terms of business okay you're Either way, you can put out of business anyone who is a competitor on the market because you already have the monopoly, essentially, even if you don't call it that, because you have 10,000 subsidiaries that own 10,000 other things, you know? So it's fine. You could have just done that, (laughs) you know, business-wise. At least keep up appearances, (laughs) no? Or am am I wrong? Why? Why? Did we at any point in Romania hear anything about how any of these corporations were doing naughty things until fairly recently and even now just some lonely voices? Why? Well, why? I, I, I don't think they... There, there's they, no image problem. When you're I mean, not in this country, but on a European level, yes, it's an image problem, obviously, because, you know, their shareholders are not Romanian, but they're still shareholders. They, sh- they still know how business works. Well, let me remind you that uh, Kraft was run at this point by a girl boss <laughs> who doesn't care about the haters. <laughs> and just to exemplify Why that, you do me like this? Yeah. No. <laughs> just to exemplify this, I'm going to tell you uh, what happened to how how the UK public uh, perceived the whole Cadbury affair. I'm very curious. <laughs> I'm sure they hated it. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Obviously. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know their hatred only increased once uh, the takeover was finalized and uh, Kraft sort of went back on its promise not to close <laughs> a factory in summer uh, in in uh, Summerdale um, you know, Bristol uh, made the Brits uh, heads explode <laughs> and, did they boycott uh, I mean, they, they asked for like a public uh, apology from Irene Rosenfeld and she just no commented their ass. Wow. <laughs> and that's all they asked for? A public apology? And she couldn't even, you know, just the concept of apologizing. Girl. <laughs> never okay. admits to never apologize. Yeah, and and uh, that factory had like 500 workers laid off, and production was outsourced to Poland. <laughs> yeah, but you know, as it happens with many takeovers, they are costly businesses, <laughs> and um, yeah, Kraft had to make sacrifices. <laughs> it uh, sold its North American frozen pizza business to Nestle. Oh, their direct competitor. Oh, wow. What a <laughs> surprise. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, those costs would go towards uh, the integration of uh, Cadbury into the big family, the big happy family of Kraft. <laughs> Then in 2011, following a period of poor share performance and investor criticism, my girl Rosenfeld <laughs> announced the split of the company into two new entities. The first one. Ent- split the assets, <laughs> no one's gonna know. <laughs> 
The first entity would re retain the Kraft Foods names and brands and focus on the North American food business, while the second, uh, that later was named Mondelez International, mm -hmm. would focus on the global snacks business and would include the former Cadbury mm -hmm. uh, business. Back in Romania, <laughs> this always sounds depressing, yeah, really does. Uh, Kraft had closed shop by the end of 2010. So late, 20, uh, late 2008, they announced we're, we're bye-bye. Mm -hmm. 2010, they were already gone. So what was left? Well, because you said, why didn't they sell the factory? Yeah. Well, they did to Lidl. They, they basically sold the land because little... Uh, oh, so they, yeah. it's not actual production? No. Fuck that. No. No, okay. the, the actual production was some of it. Like I said, they uh, hired their former, former maintenance contractor, mm -hmm. a company called Raptronic. Uh, and this one has a subsidiary uh, that is called the rap confectionery uh, and that is the one that sort of has the rights to produce a few of the former uh, Jacobs uh, Kraft Jacobs Suchard blah, 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 uh, products in Gimbav. In 2014 uh, it was when Lidl acquired the former chocolate factory for 2.17 million euros. The plant was demolished Replaced with a little store, and then Lidl sort of had plans to. This is so depressing. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, they made plans to form a joint venture and to develop a hotel on the remaining plot. The plans fell through, and from what I could find, the latest updates on this, the German company ceded parts of uh, the plot to the city for public road development. So uh, that's the story of how a few uh, seconds of financial orgasm for shareholders translates into closing up a factory and ending a century-long chocolate-making tradition. If we're honest, like all all big companies do this. Yeah, like sure. Coke does this, Nestle does this, and you know they severely affect the environment, the local communities. Like, yeah. yeah. And somehow, that's totally fine. No problem. Nothing is illegal, yeah. apparently. Well, I mean, no, it's not illegal because they have lobbyists who then just tell yeah, politicians how to make legal? the... Like, yeah. how, how did lobbying become like a legal thing? I mm -hmm. feel like that's so... That's more like a mafia than anything else. Yes, but y you know what you get told if you ask questions about that? Uh, that it's a perfectly reasonable mechanism to communicate the wishes of the constituents to to the you know to those in power and if you then mention yes but obviously like me or you or any you know average joe uh, you do not have the necessary time the necessary resources to like be there and i mean if you decentralize it you know you take it i don't understand why 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 the constituents need a middleman it is possible to have a system in order to lobby whoever you want to lobby as an individual and then you know have that system filter it out and be created in a way that it filters out information so that you know you are in touch with your constituents and all that information is public knowledge uh, who wants to hear from all the peasants <laughs> You're not even going to hear from all the peasants because all the peasants can't even get connected enough to pay their bills online. So it's fine. Yeah. You you really will not be, you know, bothered by all the peasants. <laughs> you will be bothered by, you know, the fewer peasants. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I think I think lobbyists in general and lobbyism is just bullshit. It should not exist at all. I sorry. <laughs> I understand why it does. I just don't think it should, especially in a digital age. Like, and also as a side note, I do think that bad political decisions, you know, uh, should be you know punished. Ooh. I know I'm terrible, <laughs> but I also think that being responsible for the shit that you do is, you know, you mean legally accountability. How dare I? <gasps> But if you think about it, like, 
I mean, <laughs> I mean, shouldn't it? Like, really? Like, you affect people's lives to a point where you could have them die, you know, which mm. infringes on a lot of their rights. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, the right to be alive. But, you know. So, yeah, I think I think you, people should be responsible in that sense, mm-hmm. legally. Yeah. And, yeah, they should be punished. Yeah, but uh, I think I think this is uh, I I don't want to necessarily open up a different discussion, but I think this uh, is very this is a good example of how the entire concept of what power having power uh, does has been so obfuscated for many of us that uh, as you said well shouldn't there be accountability yes but the point is the people who have the power to not be accountable can just brush you off so if power is distributed so unevenly as you said there's no leverage and if there's no leverage what are you going to count on the morality inherent morality and uh, something of the person who has the power because you know this is like super Even if, I mean, this this is superhero thinking right because you ha- you see it in like the I don't know, Ma- marvel movies like the yeah. superhero who would be able to resist arrest for instance right they're like oh no i totally won't use my power to wipe everyone you know to wipe the floor with everyone here and just you know do whatever because i'm such a moral person yes but that's fiction that's not how it happens in the real world so that's true uh but i i also feel like there's a lot of negative feeling towards companies in general let's say Mm -hmm. (laughs) i wonder why i'm just you know euphemistically speaking there are negative feelings involved um but I, I feel like people forget a lot of the times that even if you know big wigs do have these this sense of morality or the sense of direction because <laughs> they don't seem to have a sense of direction anyway but even if they do they are they have to answer to their shareholders they don't have to answer to anyone else mm-hmm. technically that is the issue yeah it's not even their internal sense of morality or direction it's the fact that the people that they have to answer to have none mm. so basically the shareholders are the issue, okay? Although I, I do feel like uh, in many ways this whole our sole responsibility is towards the shareholders. I think it's basically the post hoc uh, explanation for what these people already wanted to do, right? Like accumulate wealth and power. Because this is like... I'm not... It's not because I'm greedy or mean or heartless or anything. It's like I'm just... You know, I sort of have to. I'm contractually obligated to do this. It's beyond my control. Do you want us to wrap up? Or do you, would you like to add anything else? Before we get very depressed about... <laughs> I'm already very depressed about this. Like, I didn't know half the things. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, it's, it's just so... It's just a drop in the bucket. Yeah. But still, like when when you when you freeze it up and you inspect it like individually, it's it, it it's, it's sad- just a facet of the same tragic. It's just so it's bad. Saddening <laughs> because uh, we all remember several such stories. Yeah, uh, and I, I in particular will want to have a long chat with my mom. Because she, she was basically very much in the middle as an employee. But really, we have so many stories like this. Yeah. So many like factories that have a long history of making things that were quality things mm-hmm. for a very long time. And it's just, they all went bust. As in, after privatization and foreign investment, mostly. Okay, so Adele. Thank you very much for joining me and uh, I hope this is not the last time you will do so. Oh, it's definitely not the last time. I'm having way too much fun doing this. <laughs> good, good. Um, and for those listening, I would greatly appreciate it if you could share this podcast with your friends or loved ones and uh, stay safe and uh, remain curious. Bye. Cheers.